And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Xanadu Gallery Art Business Academy online critique group session. Uh, today is Wednesday, February 24th, almost done with the month of February already. Uh, it's good to be back here with you in another session um, and uh, enjoyed having you here last week for the Ask Me Anything session, great questions we had. And today we are back to um, reviewing uh, a, uh, a critique group member's work um, and uh, we're gonna jump right into that. Uh, as we get ready to do that, however, I just do want to make us aware, I have to do this uh, a couple times a year that uh, we have a time change coming up um, uh, I believe it's the, uh, well, I'll have to send an email out to be sure, but I think it's the second weekend in March. All y'all um, do that ridiculous dance where you change your clocks by an hour. Um, we don't do that in Arizona. And so for me, this broadcast will continue to be at the same time every week, but for the rest of y'all, it will shift by an hour. So just, just be aware that that's coming up. Keep an eye out for the email. Um, that inevitably leads to a little bit of uh, confusion, but we'll all get there. Um, so today I would like to uh, welcome our featured artist. Um, and Sue, I think I've got you here. If I can go ahead and get you to unmute. Um, there we go. Good morning, Sue. Glad to have you here in the session to be able to look at and share your artwork. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And Sue, let's begin. Um, tell us where you're located, where your studio is. I'm in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, and my studio is in a separate building on my property where I live. Yeah, excellent. And yeah. Um, a little bit of background on yourself. How did you come to um, uh, be an artist and create the work that you're creating? I started as a decorative artist, and I started doing watercolor probably about 20 years ago. I thought I had to paint something I could put in a frame and hang on a wall. That was all I thought I needed to do. So I've spent the past 20 years learning how to paint. So I work in and, watercolor, oil, and acrylic. And where did that initial um, opportunity to, to create come from or the interest in art? I think I started as a decorative artist, painting on wood, little folk art type things. And I really enjoyed it. But I always loved sketching as a kid, but I majored in accounting. So... <laughs> Yeah. You have utilized both sides of your mind in your- I have. Uh, and yeah. I also run a custom picture framing shop. I've been doing that for 20 years and that's totally left brained. So it's good. It's been yeah. really great. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, let's jump in and take a look at your work. And Sue, as we're looking at the work, maybe talk to us a little bit um, about style and technique and, and inspiration on these pieces. Sure. Um, here. There we go. So these I call atmospheric influence and definitely in the style of expressionistic um, abstracts. And I guess I fall into the cap primarily because when I begin a painting, I very seldom have a plan. And maybe that's painfully obvious to some of you, but I enjoy playing with shapes and forms and I'm trying to work into a much more limited palette. But I do find I use blue a lot, which is really interesting because it's not a color you'll find on the walls in my house. Oh, so I just, I'm really, yeah, charmed by the fact that I paint so often in those, in that hue. And this is, I think my most recent, one of my most recent paintings, I've entitled it Sentient One and Two, and um, they're 16 by 20s. I put a little gold leaf on there for some accent. Again, just playing around with movement and edge. Those are the two areas that I, I really feel I focus. I do try to consider compos compositional structures as I'm working to lead the eye to have good balance and variety. So I like these two. Yeah, and um, we, we start to get a sense as we're looking at these photos, um, you know, you've talked about kind of composition and color. Um, talk a little bit about texture. Oh, texture is huge. And it's really challenging in watercolor because, I'm sorry, acrylic, one of those other mediums. And honestly, I think everything we're gonna be looking at today is acrylic because the bulk of the work that I have in galleries are the acrylic pieces. So um, acrylic tends to lie flat when you paint with it. So it's very challenging to get that impasto effect that you see with oil. And I love oils. 
But when I take a cap off a tube of oil paint, I become the most uncoordinated person in the world. And there is cadmium orange or dioxazine violet everywhere. So I, I enjoy acrylic. I think it kind of lends some of the spontaneity that I like with watercolor with a little bit more of the structure of oil. So I guess I kind of find that a happy medium. Did I answer your question or did I go? Yeah, nope, nope, that's perfect. <laughs> so this one again in this latest style of work I've been doing is called time travel. Uh, it's a triptych, they're all 24 by 24s, it's quite large. Back to that texture, I actually put that on the canvas before I begin painting as an, kind of an underpainting. And I use a couple of different products to do that, um, a super heavy gesso, um, a volcanic kind of gesso structure stuff. And I usually place that on with a palette knife. So I would prime my canvases a couple of times and then I put on the texture and then I begin the painting. And as I'm painting, I try to increase the effect of that texture with the way that I apply the paints. And um, we've seen already a couple of panel pieces um, and you mentioned um, in your submission, you had a question about, um, should I be doing panel work? Should I be just be doing larger canvases? So talk about that push and pull. <laughs> Yeah, I do do a lot of triptychs. I work with a couple of people or one gallery that sells almost exclusively to interior decorators and designers. And I also work with an interior designer. So I'm always trying to think about things that will kind of fill a wall or that can be more um, flexible. And I did start doing some panel pieces. I didn't include them because they don't photograph as well, but they're like six by 48 or six by 24, very long and narrow, really challenging to get a decent composition on, but there's so much fun to mix and match. And they, I think they would be very good for using in lots of different situations. So um, I do quite a number of pieces of the seacoast. I did quite a few seascapes for quite a while. And again, I'm trying to abstract them. I want them to have a sense of mystery about them, rather kind of in, not painting what I'm seeing as much as trying to paint what I feel for having seen it, trying to express a little bit of that. This is honestly one of my favorite favorites. I just, I don't even know what it means. I called it Chinese blossoms because on the left-hand side, there's an allusion to the plant, which is, um, has these beautiful little balloon shape pods on it. But then there's also the Chinese lanterns that are set off into the sky with a candle. And there's that kind of floating thing in the middle. So I went with that. <laughs> I know I did not have a big plan. I knew what colors I wanted to work with in general. And, um, you know, obviously trying to work here with the complements of blue and orange. And then let's just take a quick look at presentation. And um, this is gonna raise some questions. The first two, um, first the, the, uh, the artwork here um, is, feels much more representational. Um, and, and, you know, in a bit of a different style. Um, but, and, and then we see this kind of more traditional frame for, for the piece and, and similarly on this, the second one. And then this third one kind of feels more like what we've seen in the other images. So, so talk Absolutely. a little bit both about um, your approach to format and presentation um, and maybe a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of the diversity of subject matter. Oh yes, let's talk about that. Um, if you back up two slides to the, um, yeah, I just recently sold that painting. Interesting story, I mentioned I'm a custom framer. I had a customer come in to frame a very large piece and he was stuck between two very expensive frames. Susie ordered the wrong one, joined. So I wound up owning this frame and I had a canvas stretched and tried to do a painting that would fit the frame. But interestingly enough, it's an unusual way to frame acrylics or works of art on canvas. It is floated on top of the linen liner. And if you look at the next image, that's actually a watercolor, but it's done um, using absorbent ground on a wood panel. So you can frame it without glass, which I love. And that's also mounted on top of the linen liner. So it kind of gives it more of an effect of a float mount. I like it traditionally that painting would be under the lip of that linen liner, which is kind of nice to pull your eye in. So I've been enjoying playing with that. And this and is my more standard, 
you know, that's one of those deep canvases that you can buy. And I like to use those, especially when I was doing shows, you know, transporting my work back and forth because you, you don't have to worry about the frame. And I know you've probably all, all heard a thousand times or at least twice, oh, I love that painting, but that frame just doesn't work for me. You know, so just negate that. I do like to wrap the painting around the edges. I didn't completely do that on this one, but I got around to doing most of it anyway. Yeah. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll just paint those edges a neutral, typically a medium gray, or one of the tones that's in the painting, just a very soft, just to finish them up. We will um, note with some irony that, um, uh, that, that there is just some kind of, um, well, I'm, I'm not even sure quite what to call it, that here you are a framer and doing <laughs> works that are, are unframed and, and gallery wrapped. Um, and, and for all the reasons I think that many of us do, that um, you, you know, it, there is some simplicity there. And, and frankly, um, you know, with the more contemporary abstracted work, a lot of times it's nice to not have that hard edge that a frame and, and matting and that kind of thing bring to a, a piece of art. Um, sure. So with that, Sue, let's, let's jump in and um, invite uh, some of our panelists into the uh, conversation. I would love to get general reactions to the work and your thoughts on um, kind of the, 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 the flow of the work from one piece to another and the consistency of what we're seeing. And so um, if you're in the panel, um, well, let me, let me. Well, Marilyn had asked in the chat whether or not I sealed that watercolor. Absolutely, I did. Any work of art on paper has got to be framed under glass to protect it. So the ability to do that watercolor on a board um, is a little bit challenging. It lifts a little bit more easily. You cannot brush a sealer onto your watercolor painting. You'll move all the pigments. So you spray that finished painting very lightly with an acrylic sealer, and then you can go ahead and put on a nice archival satin finish or whatever you'd like if you want. A lot of times on my um, structured acrylics with all the texture, I'll add a more of a gloss finish to them because it helps to show that texture. But then again, you get a lot more reflecting and bouncing of light, which can be distracting. So it's kind of a finding a happy medium on the, on the varnishes. Sure. Yeah, excellent. Okay, good. Um, so anyone in the panel, if you want to throw a hand up or unmute yourself and hop in, I would love to get some reactions. And um, as usual, if I don't get volunteers, I will volunteer you. So uh, Stella, I see you there. Let's, it should be asking you to unmute. Morning, Stella. Hello. Hi. Um, I've really enjoyed all of the work. It's been really lovely. And some of it, some of those um, more kind of undulating ones uh, remind me a bit of, of some of the work I've done. So I re really love the blues. Um, but I was really taken by the Chinese lanterns ones because it, it seemed quite experimental and um, you've got some, you know, there's some kind of real difference in there. I just wondered if you could talk through that. Well, I think I was, I try to maintain some spontaneity in my work. I wanted to have energy. I wanted to have movement, you know? But yeah, one of the things I, I would critique in my own work is that I have a lot of small shapes and I've always painted that way. And I really struggle with leaving large areas with very subtle um, tonal shifts or value shifts. And I'm really working at that. And I think that's probably why I like Chinese lanterns. I left some big shapes alone which I guess I'm, I'm one of those painters who just kind of likes to continually get back in there. And then that's also part of the reason I use the texture on the bottom, because I'm looking for that loose type of feeling. If I texture my canvas and use a really big brush, that pigment is not gonna go where I think it belongs. It's gonna kind of do its own thing. And I'm trying to learn to let that happen. So I think the large gestural shape moving from the right to the left with that little bit of black and pulling the eye, you know, and then I guess we could follow that black. So I guess I feel like it leads the eye pretty well. Yeah. 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 I, I really like the diagonal across the middle as well. Thank you. Mm. And Stella, what's your last name? I'll go check your workout. Uh, sure. S-H-A-W. I'm redoing my website at the moment, so there's not very much to see, but I, there will be. <laughs> That is great. When you said sure, I thought you were talking like a New Englander. No. Sure. Ah. 
but then no, Thanks that's your last name. So thank you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Uh, who else you. wants to jump in with uh, a comment or a reaction to the work and the consistency of the work? Going. I have a question. Okay, go, uh, Sue. How does the panel feel about getting more structure with maybe a little more linear element? Would that be beneficial? Um, I don't link my tri triptychs very often, the seascape I did, but I don't try to line everything up. Basically, you could arrange those panels in almost any direction. So I try to leave some of that open for interpretation, but I'm considering getting more linear in, in, or adding some linear elements. So I'd be interested in what people think of that. Yeah, anyone want to jump in with a comment on that? My, uh, my instant response is that experimenting is a great way to find out how well something works and, and uh, seeing, you never know, uh, you know, putting a few down on, on Canvas and starting to, to work with it can, can lead to some very interesting results for sure. Thanks. Uh, Gay. There we go. Uh, yeah, I'm with everybody else on that. Push, push, push. Um, I'm looking at the two that have the gold in it. Yes. And I'm wondering not to do anything to them, please don't. <laughs> right. But, you know, there's a sense that you're pulling the eye into, not the center, but the sort of little dark blue. Right. Um, you know, you could always try just linearizing something on there to see what happened. That's a good I'm idea. Loath, I'm loath to add a lot because your lanterns added very little and achieved a lot of what you're talking about. Right. So it's a big experiment time. Now in the darker paintings, not the beach, the beach makes sense all on its own. You don't need to, this one is time travel. Yes. I think, I always say to myself, what is this painting telling me? And I'm sure you do too from what you said. And does it want me to do anything else quickly? Right. And I actually don't think linear is the way necessary to go because you're shifting all kinds of textures and uh, color striations here. And you could just focus them somewhere so that one part of this is in a sense obvious or not. I'm I not thought about this. that. I'm just saying, go for it. <laughs> Create a very distinctive impact area with, you know, higher contrast and, and brighter colors or something. Subtly, even subtly, your lanterns are subtle. Yes. They're not, you haven't gone here and say, oh, no, I'm really going to make a lantern. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. So it doesn't take much in your work. And I would just encourage you to do it. And if you find yourself freezing, I'm a great believer in taking your brush in the hand you don't write with or mm. paint with and doing something with that one because you lose control. And for once the paint actually can say, ha ha, here I am, I'm going to do this. So that sounds like fun, thanks. It is fun actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Gay. Uh, Santana, I think I've got you. Yeah, hi. Well, I really love your work and you um, so I think it's very consistent. Um, I think you have a linear element in the beach stroll but it makes me feel the ocean. I said in the chat, even though uh, if I didn't know the title, I would feel ocean. But time yeah. travel takes me in to another dimension because of the way you've got the lighter color, it pulls me. So it does feel there's the movement there, but rather than get too linear, I like the organic um, circular feeling about your work. There's a cloud-like feeling and I yeah. love the texture and I feel there is a consistency because of color, texture, um, and everything else. So yeah, Thank I think you so beautiful. much. I should tell you guys, I hired my stepdaughter to write art statements for me. <laughs> and the one, if you ever have a chance to go to my website, it's suedionart.com. You can read some of her art statements, but on time travel, she wrote this wonderful art statement about looking at the earth from space, which was totally not my inspiration. Yeah. She writes them for me in the first person and she makes me sound like I paint with intent, which is wonderful. <laughs> but she wrote another one for a painting called Currents, which we're not looking at. And she talks about inspiration and how sometimes it's that slow glacial movement that you don't even see or recognize. And sometimes it's a rushing river it's amazing. And then she also explains why I use blue so often, which was such a relief for me. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. 
Yeah. So Thank let's let's um, explore a little bit more the consistency of the work because I you, you know um, it, it it's a subject we get into with every artist who comes into these sessions, mm -hmm. um, and we're kind of looking for what are the what are the threads that tie the work together or what are the elements that maybe introduce a little bit of dissonance among the different pieces. Um, and I, I'm interested to talk to you about consistency because I, I think your approach to consistency is maybe a little bit different than a lot of the other artists that we've looked at in that, um, you know, a lot of the times it's uh, subject matter and thematic elements are kind of the strongest consistent um, aspects of an artist's work. You have some variety in terms of, I, I mean, it's, sometimes it almost seems a little hard to talk about subject matter when we're talking about abstract work. Um, but I do think that um, even in abstract work, the, the compositional elements lead us to um, a subject, even if it's non-objective. Um, but, but uh, you know, if, as we look across these pieces and, and you know, especially this piece where um, now, now we all of a sudden get more of a suggestion maybe than we've seen in the other works of a composition and, and a subject, um, you know, you might think of this as an outlier and, and it might start to feel like, okay, do we have some inconsistency here? Or, you know, are there some issues where if this work was hanging in a gallery, would clients be confused to see this piece and, and maybe even, um, you know, maybe even the lanterns has a little bit, maybe different stylistic feel to it. But I feel that your work is a good example of um, palette and technique being so strong that it helps to bring and tie together all of the work in spite of those differences, maybe in, um, you know, again, in, in some of the compositional elements and in the subject matter. Um, and I'd be curious um, to hear you talk about a little bit, um, you know, is, is there a conscious effort on your part to kind of think of the bigger picture of your body of work and how each piece is going to relate to the other work you're creating? How much, um, you know, conscious effort are you putting into that? I am putting much more conscious effort into that having made your acquaintance, Jason. Oh. <laughs> um, previously, I just kind of painted what I was drawn to. I also teach. So I have a student who wants to paint this. And so we work on that and I throw it up for sale. And then I have another student and I'm always painting demos for my classes. So my work was always technically probably pretty similar. One of the things that I look for that I work toward, even in my representational work, is something that I refer to as lost edges you know, where the value of that leaf and the value of the field behind it are so similar that that leaf gets lost in the field, that your eye just kind of trans goes across. And I, I love lost edges. I love to make the suggestions of things and that's how I go about doing it. So, but I am trying to work much more in the area of abstract, I guess for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm not a very highly detailed oriented person. So this style of work seems to fit my personality a little bit better, even though I know I tend to go in there and pick. Um, but I also just find it very freeing, challenging, extremely challenging. You know, I, I've seen abstract artists who will do a bunch of thumbnails and I think thumbnails are really important. Value studies, all of that applies, but I don't do it. I get in there and I just work. I don't usually listen to music when I'm working. Occasionally I will. If I do listen to music, I never listen to music that has words because then I'll start singing along in my head. Left brain, right? Takes me out of whatever it is, wherever I'm trying to go with the painting. And I do will do it in stages. And I can't tell you how many times I've done an underpainting and loved it, but said to myself, oh, I can't sell that. I didn't do enough work to it and get in there and muck it about and then struggle trying to get back to where it was just perfect. So that's yeah. kind of, and that's really hard with abstract work. It's really hard to know when you can put your brush down and walk away. Yeah, good. Well, uh, and, and let me throw that out to the, the, the panel. And I think I'll go to Carol first. You, you raised a hand and, and uh, have a comment. Um, Carol, what's your reaction to that? I'm enjoying this work. So thank you very much for sharing it. Thank you. And Carol. I have a question for you and then maybe 
possibly a follow-up comment. I'm curious, and you you kind of touched on it right at the end there, where you say that, uh, well, you said earlier that you can't help going back into some work. Um, I'm, my question is, let's get to the point, is the speed at which you're working, because I see throughout these um, a different pace of work in some of in some of these pieces, and I'm curious if you feel like you work at the same pace all the time, and especially like me and who I work in abstract as well, um, I find that if I'm working on a piece and I don't finish and I come back the next day, you know I have to go through a little ritual of my own before I can touch that piece again because I have to get to the same place in my head hmm. and sometimes I'm in a hurry to finish it and then that's when everything goes sideways so um like the Chinese lantern it you know I I sense a, a lovely um serenity in that piece and I think we're part of it is the broader strokes of color and also a, just a, a pace that's uh, evident or I'm imagining it. I think one of the things I try to emulate also in the work is I find a certain grace and loveliness in nature, just the, the way a, a branch will fall or, you know, just the ocean and the, the rhythm and the movement. And I think I try to bring some of that to my work. But if you looked at atmospheric influence one and two, I didn't technically paint those as a diptych I did paint them at about the same time, but if I were to critique them for my, and I would, I, oh, I should put a little more of that pink in, into the one on the left. It doesn't have enough contrast. There isn't enough, but at some point it's just done. And like you said, to come back and go into a piece, who knows where my mind went at that moment when I was creating that, you know, and to try to snake myself back into that, I know I'm going to bring a different day, a different expression. So I, I do appreciate your thoughts and I'd love to know what your uh, method is for getting back in. I, I'm forever telling my students warm up, warm up. You know, I don't know what it is in every other um, artistic pursuit. It's practice. Singers, musicians, actors, they practice, they practice, they, pra they perform. And yet you put a brush into a painter's hand and it has to be a masterpiece. Every time we sit down, I just don't think we give ourselves permission to play to experiment, to, you know, warm up. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. so I do really appreciate your thoughts. And it's a constant reminder to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, Carol, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, only, I'll keep it short because it's not about me, but uh, that I do have a ritual uh, every day when I go into the studio and when I leave the studio. So- uh, I'll and, look and, for that. I'll look for some ideas for that. Um, yeah. Well, part I, I of it is out of necessity because my studio is outdoors oh, nice. under a covered patio. And uh, fortunately I'm in Northern California. So I got most of the year to paint outside, but uh, right. everything I have is on rolling racks and my rolling table and everything has to be covered and buttoned up and bungeed the, cool. the around. So the prepping of your studio is almost a meditative yes. time for Correct. you. Sure. you yes. And the same channel. thing at the end of the day. Very yeah. nice. Okay, Thanks. good. Let me, um, I, yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit then, um, Sue, about um, kind of your efforts to get your work out into the world and exposure. Um, you know, where are you showing your work? What has, has the audience's reaction been? Um, talk a little bit about the business side of, of your work. Oh, the business side. I do try to be pretty consistent with my Instagram thing. You know, I want a thousand followers. Well, who are they anyway? So there's that. But it's just, it kind of gets your name out there. I've been teaching watercolor for 20 years. So I have fairly good name recognition locally. Um, there was a time when I first started painting that I did enter a lot of shows. And so I have a lot of accolades and awards and all that's really great because it builds my resume. And when I do that, I have all those accolades in there somewhere, you know, just try to keep growing it. And I finally approached a gallery, um, I guess it was about five years ago. And, you know, it took me a couple of contacts. And he said to me, thank you so much 
for being consistent, you know, and he does sell a good deal of my work. He beats me up on price almost every time. It's terrible. But I have, you know, again, in recent months, increased the price of my work. My work is fairly quick. I think someone had asked about how much time each piece takes. And I have that thing in my head that I have to put a certain amount of effort into it. And I'm really struggling with that. You know, my work is not typically the kind of work that you put into these competitions and take first place or even an honorable mention because I didn't spend 40 hours and, and that shows, but I have found there's a place for it. And I, so I enjoy working with this one gallery who works with a lot of um, designers. Unfortunately, he's gonna be retiring soon. Oh, I can't tell you how many galleries I've got in and then they retired. So um, it's like I'm the bad penny. Yeah. And then I do work with a decorator <laughs> out on the Cape. And I really want to, I have been approaching galleries on the Cape. I would like to build that part of my business. Because of COVID, I've had to close my building because I teach in that building as well. And my studio is an addition on the back. So I'm moving my framing business into my home. I will always have to frame for myself. I've got customers that still call, great. So I'll continue to do that, but I'm trying to rent the front half of that building and keep my studio on the back. Either that or I have to move it into the apartment in the basement and it's terrible. I'll yeah. be in the kitchen, but you never know. I'll cook up whatever it takes. But um, I have been approaching galleries. I have not been successful. And I need to rewatch that section that talks about follow-up. But um, I'm, I'm excited about it. I have every confidence that I will gain more representation. My goal is to be in five galleries. I don't know if that's a realistic goal. No, no, artist. definitely. And, and um, you know, looking at your work and, and well, and, and that's a good segue in to talk about um, pricing and, and values. Um, uh, and, and certainly, um, uh, well, all of you that are here and certainly those of you who are in the Art Business Academy know that um, I, I am a big advocate in believing that no matter what kind of work you're doing, there is an audience and a market and galleries out there who would be perfect for kind of bringing all of that together. Um, I do think with, with your work, Sue, that you've got a pretty um, broad potential marketplace um, with your subject matter and style and, and palette um, and, and kind of the, the more contemporary nature and presentation of the work that there is a, you, you know, a ready market out there that, um, that you'd be able to get to. Talk to us a little bit about um, kind of your, the, the, the pricing for your work, how you arrived at the pricing that you are. Maybe let's talk a little bit about how that gallery owner beats you up a little bit on pricing and, <laughs> and um, uh, kind of the mechanics of your pricing. I was charging a dollar a square inch. I am now up to 175 and sometimes I'll push it up to two, but again, because, well, anyway, that's where I'm at. So the gallery had brought uh, that piece I mentioned, Currents, to a restaurant and said, Sue, restaurants almost never buy original art. They don't have the money for it. They want posters. I don't expect a lot. And I got a call from him. The woman loved the painting. It worked so well in the space where she wanted it. Unfortunately, it was a 36 by 48. It was too large for the space. So she asked the gallery owner, could we cut this down? No, we can't cut the painting down. Thank you very much, Dominic. But he commissioned me to do a triptych I'm gonna need this really fast. I'm gonna need this. Can you get this done in like a week and a half? Okay, I've got, let me see if I've got the right size canvases in the studio. I found enough canvases. Yeah, I can do it for you. I like, you've got to really help me out with the price here because you know, these people, this, they have a budget, yeah. but they don't have a very much, I can't, I don't even want to tell you what I sold it to him for. Okay, and never mind. I sold it to him for probably half of what I should have gotten. He needed it done quick. He wanted it cheap. He got both those things. I still haven't gotten the check. And he even said to me at one point, he said, you know, Sue, the bottom line is even if the restaurant doesn't take the paintings, I asked you to paint them. I will buy them from you. Okay. Yeah. But we've had a long-term <laughs> relationship. I'm not, I'm not running out of food. I'll get the check when I get the check. And when it comes in, it'll be great. And that's fine. So yeah, and, and there's, you know, there's something to be said, and, and you'll hear me um, talking here about, and, and especially in the Academy, talking about the importance of coming up with a, a pricing structure and, and a plan um, for your approach to, to the value of your work and the growth in value of your work. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, there's a reason that, especially early in an artist's career, 
typically you end up being a little bit scrappy about um, getting your work out there. We want the work out there. We want to start getting some momentum going in sales and we want to start building a, a collector base. Um, and I will tell you that in my experience, especially as I'm working with and, and um, you know, I do quite frequently bring artists into the gallery where I may be their first gallery or maybe their first gallery in a major art market. Um, and um, I know that when that happens, um, you know, these artists uh, are often going to be, um, I I'm choosing my words carefully here, but they're going to be more um, flexible in negotiation when it comes time to make a sale happen. Because, um, you know, you're at that point where you just want to get the work moving and out there and uh, established. Um, and, and then as time goes on and you get more representation and you're showing in um, more established venues, um, you know, and it, it, your baseline for, for the value of your work is going to continue to climbing up, climb up. And it won't be necessary to do quite as much negotiation and um, back and forth. And that's OK. Um, you know, there's not one right answer to how you're going to work with your galleries or, or directly with your clients in terms of negotiation. Um, throughout the course of your career. It can, it can certainly evolve over time. And I wonder, um, anyone want to jump in with comments or questions about the pricing and the value? And I'll say that um, uh, Sue is in the Art Business Academy. So we've worked on pricing and, and have had conversations about this. Um, but I will tell you that, uh, you know, for a lot of artists who are, are kind of breaking in or emerging into the gallery market, that price range of $1.75, to 250, 275. There's a lot of volume of art being sold um, in that price range. That that's a price range, um, you know, where um, you're, you're probably not getting as many of your uh, big heavy hitter collectors buying, but you're getting a broader uh, middle market, if you will, of the art market coming in and buying at those price points. Um, artwork. Um, you know, that, that's going to go into someone's home and be enjoyed and, and not necessarily thought of as a big investment that we're making or, or something along those lines. So anyone want to jump in with comments or questions about pricing and Sue's pricing and approach or negotiation on um, sale of artwork? No, nothing to say. All right. So, so <laughs> let, me, let me go to Carol and then I'll go to Gay. Uh, just a quick one um, that on your website, uh, there's there few of the paintings have sizes on them. So really look at them and see the price, but not the size. So it would be difficult to gauge. I think what maybe what you if you check, if you click on the image, you get more information. Correct. But it, I will double but, check that. That's that's yeah. definitely a problem. I so appreciate you pointing that out. OK, that was it. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Yeah. And, and that's a good point. Um, I am a big advocate on our websites and in our portfolios of providing viewers as much information as we possibly can. I love that you're creating artwork statements um, and giving them size and pricing information is, is, is awesome. Let me go to, um, uh, I think I had Gay and then I also see Kim. I see you've got a hand up, so we'll get to you too. Gay. I'll be very brief because Kim hasn't said anything yet, but um, many, many years ago, and I think it must be almost 28, I was doing floor cloths by hand. They were beautiful things. People were buying them, but I only charged a dollar a square inch because they were just for the floor kind of thing. Out of that, at a show I did, came a commission from a restaurant for seven pieces, wow. okay? ranging in size from 30 by 36 by 48 to the most enormous one, which was 40, uh, 78 by 78 or something. They were particularly positioned. I had to do a certain style. This is a Middle Eastern restaurant. I, and I thought, oh, great. You know, but he got them all at the square inch price. Oh. Yeah. But, but they were up for the entire rest of that restaurant's life. He said they never had to redecorate. They had weddings in front of some of them. They, are, they kept them all together when they closed, you know. And out of that, people saw my work over the period of 25 years. Yep. So it's a sort of winsome 
lose some at one sense. Well, yeah, and and no, that's a great point. And and again, kind of you know, if we think about the arc of uh, an artist's career, um, and it would be impossible to say typical artist, but if you think about the arc of an artist's career. Um, you, you know, it does take some real effort in the initial phase and, and beginning years to just start to build up to that critical mass of inventory, that critical mass of exposure, that critical mass of representation. And so typically an artist is going to be putting, I mean, just really pushing. You're, you're putting a lot of work into getting the artwork in front of people and seeing and you take the opportunities as they come along. And of course, as we do that, we're trying to become more and more structured and organized and consistent in uh, both in the work and in the value of the work. Um, but, but again, um, I, I mean, goodness, when we, we started our gallery, we were scrappy too. We had to fight for every single sale to keep the doors open initially and, um, and to build the relationships and get get our name out there. And, and likewise, as an artist, you're gonna be facing a lot of that in the, in the initial phases of, of building a following for your work as well. Uh, Kim, let me get you in and you're gonna get the last word from the panel. And then I do wanna get a couple of comments that were sent in by email. Good morning, Kim. Hi, good morning. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I was telling a friend yesterday, I'm starting to feel like a traveling salesman. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I've, I've been doing the rounds recently of my region of the galleries. Um, but I had a question about the pricing, um, and especially because Sue is a framer. Um, and I don't know if you work on paper, but I do see that some of your work, you, you know, we mentioned some of it's framed, some of it's just gallery wrapped. Do you make a distinction in your pricing per square inch based on those uh, components? Great question. I, I keep the framing of my art consistent, excuse me, the pricing of my art. So the art will be always that same multiplier, but then I do add on the value of the frame. So that's how I do it. I don't add the framing in. And I am very fortunate that I, as a framer, I buy my materials at cost and that's a significant savings, but there is obviously still value. And so I will charge more. I just upgrade it or upcharge it for the framing. And a lot of times yeah. people will ask, can I have that without the frame? I don't have to recalculate the price. I know what the pricing of the art is. It's consistent. Yeah, good. Yeah, great question, Kim. Um, and, and let me, we, we are over time a little bit, but I do want to get uh, to just a couple of quick closing comments. Um, I received uh, quite a bit of, of um, feedback and response to your work. Um, and uh, Claudia from uh, Prince Rupert says, I really enjoyed the delicious sensual palette. Possibly there could be more darks. Uh, the viewer's eyes led through the paintings. I would possibly photograph her work in black and white just to see contrast. Her sense of composition is great. Um, thank you for that input, Claudia. Uh, Jeff, which I've got Jeff here, but I'm just going to quickly read it. it. says, I love the first four pieces here. I like the energy they convey and your color palette works really well. I also really like the multiple... Uh, Really like the multiple image works uh, where each one um, complements the others rather than simply extends the composition. I have to admit the last one loses me a bit in terms of structure and composition. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, that's the, the Chinese lantern. Isn't it interesting yeah. how yeah. we can have a perspective on our work and we can even get people to agree with us. And then someone comes in and has exactly the opposite perspective um, on, on how the work is. And that's what's so much fun about art is that um, everybody gets to bring their own experience to it and work to it. Um, and then I'll, I'll close with this from Charisse. Uh, the first few look similar. I preferred the seascapes and Chinese lanterns. I like the three together. For my taste, I like more contrast. So there we go. We have a, a few who are kind of responding to the values and the, and the contrast. But I think overall, um, Sue, the, the, the consensus is we love the direction that you're working in and what you're mm -hmm. doing and um, that, that there's a lot of opportunity there um, to continue exploring and, and doing great work. Sue, I'll give you the final word. Oh, thank you. I do so appreciate all of your thoughts. I very much appreciate this group and I join in quite often out there on the edges and I just really appreciate the concrete criticism very much. Well, thank you, Sue, and thank you for agreeing to be our featured artist um, and giving us an opportunity to see and talk about your work. I saw in the chat there was a question about, hey, how do we get to be um, uh, featured and have our work reviewed? 
you can um, it, on the broadcast page um, where you went to, to sign into the session, if you just scroll down a little bit, there is a form, uh, a link to a form that you can use to submit your own artwork for um, review and consideration to be included in these sessions. Be aware that we have a long list of artists who have submitted their work, but um, get your work into the, the queue for sure. And I would encourage everyone who's here um, to hop in and submit your work. We would love to see it. And, um, and um, eventually we'll work our way through our backlog and, and get, get to um, everyone. Thanks for joining us, everyone, uh, for this session. We'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, same time, same place. Um, until then, be well.